Hi friends, how are you doing? Welcome back to story time. This is our 8 to 12 age group. We are reading um, The Indian in the Cupboard written by Winry Banks. Um, I hope that you have been enjoying the story as we have been reading it. It's getting a little bit exciting, um, especially since we last read Patrick had put an Indian in the cupboard against Omri's wishes and turned him alive. Uh, Patrick had wanted something, and so he grabbed an Indian and, and brought him to life and then was going to take him home and tell his whole family all about him. And Omri convinced him to not do that um, and to let uh, Omri keep him overnight. But Patrick insisted that Omri bring him to school the next day um, and that if he didn't, if Patrick said that if Omri didn't bring the Indian to school the next day, that uh, Patrick was going to tell everybody about the Indian in the cupboard and, and everything. And so Omri definitely didn't want that to happen. But Omri also wanted to protect the cowboy um, because Patrick was not even being careful with him at all, was not trying to... Um, be gentle with him. He shoved him in his pocket and along with a horse and either one of them, both of them could have been hurt. And so Patrick didn't understand, um, how to be gentle and take care of him. So that's where we are uh, picking up on our book. This is chapter nine and it is called shooting match. Omri put the cowboy and the horse in his sock drawer while he had the quickest supper on record. Then he raced upstairs again, stopping only to pinch a few grains of Gillian's rat feed for the two horses. Shut up in his room, he took stock. A room this size was like a sort of indoor national park to the cowboy and the Indian. It should be easy enough to keep them apart for one night. Omri thought first of putting the new pair straight back into the cupboard and then bringing them back to life the next morning in time for school, but he had promised Patrick not to. So he decided to empty out the dressing-up crate and put the cowboy and his horse in there for the night. The crate was about two feet square, made up of planks. There was certainly no visible way out of it for the cowboy. Omri put him carefully down into it. Looking down at him, he felt curious about his name, where he came from, and so on, but he decided it was better not to, to talk to him. The cowboy had clearly decided that Omri was not really there at all. When his big hand reached down, carrying some cold stew, grain for the horse, some fragments of apple for them both, and later some cotton wool and scraps of material for bedding, the cowboy deliberately covered his eyes by pulling down his hat brim. It was only when Omri reached in one final time to give him a drink of water in a minute green glass bottle that he found in the bathroom cupboard that the cowboy even spoke a word. Take that filthy stuff out of here, he suddenly shouted in his strong Texas accent. I ain't aiming to drink no more of that long as I live. And he heaved the bottle, which was almost as big as himself, up by its base and tipped its contents out onto the boards of the bottom of the crate. It's only water, Omri ventured to say. You shut your mouth, shouted the little man. I won't take no lip from no gall darn hallucination. No, sir. Maybe I do drink too much. Maybe I can't hold me liquor like some old them old real tough guys do. But if and I'm a getting the delirium trimmings, them starting to see things, why couldn't I see pink elephants and dancing rats and all them purty things other fellas see when they gets far gone? It ain't fair for me to see giants in blue deserts and get put in boxes the size of a Grand Canyon with no one but my little horse for company. He sat down on the pile of hay, took the horse's nose in his arm, and put his face against it and began to sob. Omri was shattered. A cowboy? Crying? He didn't know what to do. When his mother's cried, when his mother cried, as she did sometimes when things got too much, she only asked to be left alone till she felt better. 
Maybe all grown-ups were like that. Omri turned away and got slowly into his pajamas and then went to see how Little Bear was getting along on the far side of the crate. He finished the painting. The teepee looked really good. Little Bear was now in the longhouse, arranging his blanket for the night. The pony was tethered to the post on a long rope. Omri took out the rat food and gave it to him. Then he called Little Bear out. Are you okay? Anything you need? He should have known better than to ask. Plenty. Want fire in longhouse? Keep warm? Keep animals away? Want tomahawk? So you can chop bits out of my leg? Little Bear angry when say that. Sorry now. Use tomahawk, cut down trees, chop firewood, kill fish. What fish? Little Bear replied with a very good imitation of a fish swimming. Then he did a mime of catching it, putting it onto a block, and with a whirl of his arm, chopping off its head with a gleeful relish. I don't know about that. You get tomorrow. Fish from plastique. Good tools, but fire now, Chief Little Bear say. Hamri sighed. He went to the waste pepper basket and picked out the remains of the other fire that he had thrown away in there. There was quite a lot of the fire lighter left. He gathered up some of the bits of willow bark and twigs from where Little Bear had been working. You've not, you're not having it inside, though. Far too dangerous. He arranged the fire on the packed earth of the seed tray about six feet inches from the entrance of the longhouse, first moving the teepee to safety. Then he struck a match, and soon there was a cozy blaze. Little Bear crouched beside it, his red skin glowing and his eyes bright with pleasure. Little Bear, can you dance? Yes, many kinds. Would you do one now so I can see? He hesitated. Then he shook his head once. Why not, though? No reason, dance. Maybe if I get you a wife? The Indian looked up eagerly. You get? Give word. I only said I'd try. Then, little bear, dance. Then do best dance. Love dance. Omri turned off his light and drew back from the scene. It looked amazingly real, with the fire-making shadows with little horse munching his grain and the Indian sitting on his heels warming himself, wearing his colorful headdress and chief's cloak. Omri wished he himself were small enough to join Little Bear by the fire. Omri, are you in bed? I'm coming up in five minutes to kiss you good night. Omri felt panicky, but it was all right. The fire was going out. Already, Little Bear was standing up, yawning and stretching. He peered up through the darkness. Hey, Omri, painting's good? Great. You sleep now? Yes. Peace of great spirits be with you. Thanks. Same to you. Omri peered quickly into the crate. The poor cowboy had crawled away into a makeshift bed and was snoring loudly. He hadn't eaten a thing. Omri sighed. He hoped Patrick was making plans and arrangements. After all, if Omri could keep him his Indian secret, Patrick might be able to do the same. All might yet be well, but Omri certainly wasn't going to try the experiment again. It was all just too much worry. He climbed into bed, feeling unusually tired. His mother came in and kissed him, and the door was shut. He felt himself drifting off almost right away, when suddenly a piercing, whinnying sound was answered by another. The horses had smelled each other. They were not so far apart, and the cowboys wasn't tied up, so Omri could hear his little horse hooves clattering on the bare boards of the crate, and then the whinnies began again, high, shrill, almost questioning, Omri thought of putting on his light, but he was awfully tired. Besides, what could he do? They couldn't possibly reach each other through the planks of the crate wall. Let them whinny their heads off. They'd soon get fed up. Omri rolled over and fell asleep. He was awakened just after dawn by shots. 
He was out of bed in about one-fifth of a second. One glance into the crate showed him all too clearly that the cowboy and his horse had escaped. The second glance showed how a knot in the wood had been pushed out or perhaps kicked out by the horse, leaving an oval-shaped hole like an arched doorway, just big enough to let horse and rider through. Omri looked around wildly. At first, he could see nothing. He dropped to his knees beside the seed box and peered into the longhouse. Little Bear was not there, nor was his horse. Suddenly, some tiny thing whizzed past Omri's ear and struck the crate beside him with a ping. Twisting his head, Omri saw it, a feathered arrow the size of a pin, still quivering from its flight. So here's one of the few illustrations that we see in this book. Mm, so he didn't think that they'd be able to find each other, thought everything would be okay. But the cowboy and the horse got out of the dressing up crate. Mm. Was Little Bear shooting at him? Omri thought. Little Bear, where are you? No answer. But suddenly a movement, like that of a mouse, caught the corner of his eye. It was the cowboy, dragging his horse behind him. He was running, half bent over, from behind one chair leg to another. He had his revolver in his hand, his hat on his head. Another arrow flew, missing the crate this time and burying itself in the carpet just ahead of the running cowboy, who stopped dead jumped backward till his horse hit him, and then fired another two shots from behind the horse's shoulder. Omri, following his aim, spotted Little Bear at once. He and his horse were behind a small heap of cloth, which was like a snow-covered hill to them, but was actually Omri's vest, dropped carelessly on the floor the night before. Little Bear, safe in the shelter of this cotton mountain, was just preparing to shoot another arrow at the cowboy, one that could hardly fall, fail to hit its mark. The poor fellow was now scrambling desperately onto his horse to try to ride away and was in full sight of the Indian as he drew back his bowstring. Little Bear, stop! Omri's frenzied voice rang out. Little Bear did not stop. But his surprise spoiled his aim, and the arrow sped over the cowboy, doing no worse than sweep away his big hat and pin it to the baseboard behind the chair. Wow, that was close. If Omri hadn't yelled, then Little Bear would have shot the Indian and or the cowboy and probably had killed him. Yikes. This infuriated the little man, who, forgetting his fear, stood up in his stirrups and shouted, Tarnation take ya, ya red varmint! Way to ya catch ya! I'll have your stinkin' red hide for a sleeping bag! With that, he rode straight toward the vest hill at full gallop, shouting out strange cowboy war cries and waving his gun, which, by Omri's count, still had two bullets in it. Little Bear had not expected this, but he was only outfaced for a moment. Then he coolly drew another arrow from his quiver and fitted it in his bow. Little Bear, if you shoot, I'll pick you up and squeeze you, Omri cried. Little Bear kept his arrow pointing toward the oncoming horseman. What you do if he shoot, he asked. He won't shoot. Look at him. Sure enough, the carpet was too soft for much galloping, and even as Omri spoke, the cowboy's horse stumbled and fell, pitching its rider over its head. Little Bear lowered his bow and laughed. Then to Omri's horror, he laid down the bow among the folds of the vest, reached for his knife, and began to advance on the prostrate cowboy. Little Bear, you are not to touch him. Do you hear? Little Bear stopped. He tried to shoot Little Bear, White enemy, try take Indian's land. Why not kill? Better dead. I act quick, he not feel, you see? And he began to move forward again. When he was nearly up to the cowboy, Omri swooped on him. He didn't squeeze him, of course, but he did lift him high and fast enough to give him a fright. Listen to me now. That cowboy isn't after your land. He's got nothing to do with you. He's Patrick's cowboy, like you're my Indian. I'm taking him to school with me today, so you won't be bothered by him anymore. Now, you take your horse and get back to your longhouse and leave him to me. 
Little Bear, sitting cross-legged in the palm of his hand, gave him a sly look. You take him to school? Place you learn about ancestors? That's what I said. He folded his arms, offended. Why you not take Little Bear? Omri was startled into silence. If white fool with coward's face good enough, Indian chief good enough. You wouldn't enjoy it. If he enjoy, I enjoy. I'm not taking you. It's too risky. Risky? Fire water? Not whiskey. Risky. Dangerous. He shouldn't have said that. Little Bear's eyes lit up. Like danger. Here, too quiet. No hunting. Him only enemy, he said scornfully, peering over the edge of Omri's hand at the cowboy, who, despite the softness of his landing place, was only just scrambling to his feet. Look, he no use for fight. Little Bear soon kill. Take scalp, finish. Very good scalp, he added generously. Fine color. Look good on belt. Omri looked across at the cowboy. He was leaning his ginger head against his saddle. It looked as if he might be crying again, and Omri felt very sorry for him. You are not going to hurt him, he said to the Indian, because I won't let you. If he's such a coward, it wouldn't do your honor any good anyway. Little Bear's face fell, then grew mullish. No tell from scalp on belt if belong to coward or brave man, he said slyly. Let me kill, and I do dance around campfire, he coaxed. No, Omri began. Then he changed his tactics. All right, you kill him, but then I won't bring you a wife. The Indian looked at him for a long time. Then he slowly put his knife away. No touch. Give word. Now you give word. Take Little Bear to school. Take to plastique. Let Little Bear choose own woman. Omri considered. He could keep Little Bear in his pocket all day. No need to take any chances. If he were tempted to show the other children, well, he must resist temptation. That was all. And after school, he could take him to Yaps. The boxes with the plastic figures in them were in the corner behind a high stand. Provided there weren't too many other kids in the shop, he might be able to give Little Bear a quick look at the Lady Indians before he bought one, which would be a very good thing. Otherwise, he might pick an old or ugly one without realizing it. It was so hard to see from their tiny plastic faces what they would look like when they came to life. Okay, then, I'll take you. But you must do as I tell you and not make any noise. He put him down on the seed tray and gently shooed the horse up on the ramp. Little Bear tied it to its post and Omri gave it some more rat food. Then he crawled on his hands and knees over to where the cowboy was now sitting dolefully on the carpet. His horse's reins looped around his arm, looking too miserable to move. What's the matter? Omri asked him. The little man didn't look up. Lost my hat, he mumbled. Oh, is that all? Omri reached over to the baseboard and pulled the pin-like arrow out of the wide brim of the hat. Here it is, he said kindly, laying it on the cowboy's lap. The cowboy looked at it, looked up at Omri, and then stood up and put on the hat. You sure ain't no regular hallucination, he said. I'm obliged to you. Suddenly, he laughed. Just imagine thinking a piece of your old delirium trimmings for giving you your th hat back. Eh, I just can't figure out what's going on around here. Say, are you real or was that engine real? Because in case you ain't noticed, you're a dang sight bigger than he is. You can't both be real. I don't think you ought to worry about it. What's your name? The cowboy seemed embarrassed and hung his head. My name's Boone, but fellas call me Boo-Hoo. That's on account of I cry so easy. It's I'm soft to heart. Show me someone sad or scare me just a little and the tears just have come on my eyes and I can't help it. Omri, who had been somewhat of a crybaby himself until very recently, was not inclined to be too scornful about this and said, That's okay. Only, you needn't be scared of me, and as for the Indian, he's my friend and he won't hurt you. He's promised. 
Now, I'd like you and your horse to go back into that big crate. I'll stick the knot back in the wood. You'll feel safer, and I'll get you some breakfast. Boone brightened visibly at this. What would you like? Oh, shucks. I ain't that hungry. A couple bits of steak and three or four eggs sitting on a small heap of beans and washed down with a big old jug of coffee will suit me just dandy. You'll be lucky, thought Omri. So that's the end of that chapter. So uh, interesting how Boone is a boo-hoo Boone, they call him. He's a cry. He's a crier. So uh, he said right there at the very end, that was kind of funny. He doesn't want much of a breakfast. I'm not that hungry, but he asked for steak and three or four eggs and beans and, and coffee. And so uh, Boone's thick accent is kind of funny sometimes and difficult to understand what he's saying and but he still thinks it's all a hallucination he thinks he's still imagining things and so um, obviously Omri hasn't explained to him what has happened like he did to Little Bear and I still don't even think Little Bear fully understands everything that has happened I don't know that anybody fully understands everything that has happened to change Little Bear from a plastic toy to a, a living small human real live person or, or even now Boone or any of the other ones that they have changed. So um, this next chapter that is coming up, chapter 10, is called Breakfast Truce. So we'll find out what happens in that and, and see what happens when Omri takes uh, the little bear and Boone to how uh, Patrick reacts and what happens once they get him to school. Um it could be interesting things can happen while they're at school uh, as far as other people possibly seeing uh, either the Indian or the cowboy. So I hope that you are enjoying the Indian in the cupboard. Um, that was a pretty interesting chapter with a cowboy and Indian fighting. And Little Bear kind of knew what was going on, but the cowboy Boone had no idea what was happening in this big, vast room of... of Omri's bedroom and the things that were happening. So imagine being those little bitty teeny weeny people and seeing this great big huge person in this vast room and having this fight. So thank you for joining me today for story time and I look forward to seeing you again. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I hope that you get to go outside and enjoy some time outside as we're getting into spring and enjoying some of the beautiful weather. It's a little bit cool here today. I had to put on my jacket today because the, the sun is shining and it's beautiful, but the weather is just a little bit, the temperature is just a little bit cool, but um, still a beautiful day to get out and enjoy the gorgeousness of the day. I hope you get to do that too, and I hope I get to see you next time to find out what happens when um, Little Bear and Boone go to school with Patrick. Have a great rest of your day. Bye guys. See ya.